Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to look at sequences. So in this video, we're going to look at how to find particular terms of a sequence from what's called the general term or the nth term. We're going to look at recursion formulas and then also look at factorial notation and how it occurs within sequences. So many creations in nature involve very intricate mathematical designs or sequences of numbers. So in particular, a variety of spirals, that is what we're going to look at at first. So there's an arrangement of individual florets in the head of a sunflower actually has spirals. So if you look at the sunflower in the notes, so what the arrow is pointing to are called individual florets of the sunflower. And notice that they spiral outward. either clockwise or counterclockwise. Well, if you count the number of, of these florets on the clockwise rotation spiral or the counterclockwise spiral, you'll have numbers that appear like this, 21 in the clockwise direction, but if you trace outward from an individual floor in the counterclockwise direction, you'll find there's 34. And then again, if you look at other types of, of sunflowers or flowers or seashells or pine cones, these numbers keep coming up. 21 and 34, 34 and 55, 55 and 89, and then even 89 and 144. These numbers keep coming up in nature. So this observation is even more interesting if we consider a sequence of numbers that was investigated by Leonardo of Pisa, also known as Fibonacci, more commonly known as Fibonacci. He was an Italian mathematician in the 13th century, and he came up with this sequence of numbers that occur within nature quite frequently. The Fibonacci sequence, named after himself, is a sequence of numbers that is infinite so that, notice that there's a dot, dot, dot at the end. So that means the pattern continues for the sequence indefinitely. So it's an infinite sequence. And the sequence starts as 1 and then 1. And then you add 1 and 1 to get 2. You add 1 and 2 to get 3. You add 2 and 3 to get 5. 3 plus 5 gives you 8. 5 plus 8 gives you 13. And this pattern continues indefinitely. So the first term, so the sequence are always 1. And then how do you get the next term? Well, every term afterwards is the sum of the two preceding terms. Okay, so let's pick a couple of these out just for an example. Let's pick out 89. 89 is the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11th number in the sequence. You add the ninth and the tenth numbers in the sequence. 34 plus 55, for example, this will give you 89. Well, let's find out the next number in the sequence. Well, to get that next number, you take 55 and 89, you add them together, and you'll get the next number in the sequence, which is 144. So this pattern will continue. The number of spirals in a daisy or sunflower, 21 and 34, come up and they're both Fibonacci numbers. The numbers of spirals in a pine cone, 8 and 13, they're Fibonacci numbers. A pineapple, 8 and 13, they're also Fibonacci numbers. Like I said, this comes up in nature quite often. So in this rest of this section, we're going to look at what are actually a sequence of numbers. Why is it actually talked about in mathematics? So we're going to talk about a sequence as a function, and the terms of the sequence are values in the range of a function. So let's talk about the structure of the function with a sequence. The domain is not the set of all real numbers. For the domain for a sequence, the domains 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. These are called the counting numbers. So for instance, 1.5, that is a real number, but it's not a whole number. So 1.5 is not in the domain for a sequence of numbers. So how would you write the domain? You cannot 
use interval notation. Interval notation is a set of real numbers. The domain is just these numbers only. So you have to use curly brackets for set notation. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then after you see there's a pattern, you can put comma, dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot just means the pattern will continue forever and close the set notation. This is not equal to 1 to infinity using interval notation. Okay, 1 to infinity. This is the set of real numbers greater than 1. So for instance, 1.2 is a real number, but it's not a counting number, so it's not in the domain. Okay, so let's talk about what sequences actually really are in mathematics. So for instance, we're going to do this in terms of the Fibonacci sequence, the sequence we just looked at, and talk about why is it a function. So we're going to have this correspondence. Keep in mind, a function is a correspondence or a rule where every input value has exactly one output value. So the set of, of numbers is the positive integers or the counting numbers, and the output are the values from the Fibonacci sequence. So if you input one, that means you are looking at the first number in the sequence, and the numbers in the sequence are called terms. So f of one, you input 1 to your sequence. This is the first term in the sequence. 1 is the first number in the Fibonacci sequence. The next number you input would be x equals 2. The output is the second number in the sequence, or the second term. It was also 1. And you keep doing this. f of 3 is the third term in the sequence. It's 2. f of 4 is the fourth term, 3 f of 5 is the fifth term, which is also still 5, and so on. This pattern will continue. So the range of a Fibonacci sequence is the set, not an interval notation, just the set. 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. Remember, you do not list 1 twice. You only have to list it once in the set notation. So for example, let's try to find out what the f of 7 would be. So you input 7 into the sequence. Well, there's no formula you're inputting into the sequence. You're looking for the seventh term in the sequence. Well, the Fibonacci sequence, you add the sixth term and the fifth term, which would be f of 6 plus f of 5, which would be 8 plus 5, which is 13. So that is the seventh number in the sequence. So this notation can get rather cumbersome, writing f of 1 equals 1, f of 2 equals 1, f of 3 equals 2, and so on. So there's a shorthand notation for sequences. You use lowercase letters, and you usually use lowercase a, b, or c. We're going to use a for the sequence. So lowercase a, with a subscript, is used to represent a function that represents a sequence of numbers, rather than function notation. So from now on, we're going to use a subscript 1, or a sub 1, to mean the first number in the sequence. The second term, or the second number in the sequence, is a sub 2, and you get the point. The first six numbers in the Fibonacci sequence would be represented this way. a sub 1 is 1, that is, f of 1 is the first term in the sequence, which is 1. f of 2 is a sub 2, which is also 1 in the Fibonacci sequence, so that's the second term. f of 3 would be the third term, so that's a sub 3, which is 2, so that's the third term. Let's do one more. So f of 4 would be the fourth term, so a sub 4, and that is 3. So let's use this example that we had earlier f of 7 was f of 6 plus f of 5. You take the previous two terms, the previous two numbers, and you add them to get the next term, which would be a sub 7 is a sub 6 plus a sub 5. 
Well, the sixth term in the sequence, that is 8. The fifth term is 5. So the seventh term would be 13, just like we had before using function notation. So that's how you represent individual terms in a sequence. A sub n represents what's called the nth term or the general term of a sequence. If you put curly brackets around a sub n, you're not talking about the nth term anymore. You're talking about the entire sequence. So it's the set of the sequence a sub n. If you have curly brackets around a sub n, it's the entire sequence. So now, formally, what's the definition of a sequence? An infinite sequence, curly brackets a sub n, is a function where the domain is the set of all positive integers or the counting numbers. We saw that earlier. The function values or the output values are the terms in the sequence. And they are represented as first term a sub 1, second term a sub 2, third term a sub 3, and so on. The nth term is a sub n, and if it's an infinite sequence, the sequence goes on forever, so remember the dot 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 at the end. So with all this terminology about sequences, let's try example one. Find the first five terms for each of the following sequences where you know the nth term, or the general term. So number one, the nth term is 3n plus 2. So this is a function. This tells you how to find the nth term of your sequence. So let's do the first five terms. First term. This would be a sub 1. This would be when n equals 1, because that's your first term. So 3 times 1 plus 2, 5. So the first term is 5. Second term, a sub 2. Same idea. You're substituting in 2 for the n, so you'll get 8. So it looks like it might be the Fibonacci sequence. Let's keep going. The first two terms are 5 and 8. Third term, 3 times 3 plus 2. Nope, it's not 13. You only get 11. So it's not the Fibonacci sequence. So the, looks like the sequence is increasing by 3 each time. Let's see if it continues this pattern. 3 times 4 plus 2. That's 14. So it looks like you're increasing by 3. So that's good. And then one more. Fifth term would be a sub 5. So 3 times 5 plus 2 is 17. So we have the first five terms in the sequence. Let's try another problem. Number 2. This time the sequence is a sub n equals 3 to the power n. So let's try to find the first five terms again. First term would be a sub 1. This time you're substituting n to the exponent. So 3 to the first power, 3 second term a sub 2 would be 3 squared or 9 third term would be 27 a sub 3 3 cubed fourth term notice how large these values are growing you have base 3 to the fourth which is 81 and then the fifth term would be a sub 5, 3 to the fifth power, 243. So just looking at these first two examples, what do these sequences remind you of? What type of functions? Well, the first one looks like you're increasing by a constant amount, by adding 3. So it looks like a linear function. So we'll talk more about this type of sequence in the next video. This is called an arithmetic sequence. What about number 2? This should remind you of what we talked about in chapter 4 with exponential functions. It looks like you have base is 3 and the exponent is the variable, in this case would be the n. So it looks like the values are growing exponentially. So this is an exponential growth function. And we'll talk more about these in section 8.3 with geometric sequences. So let's try a couple more. Number 3 a sub n equals negative 1 to the n power times n plus 3. So the first term is a sub 1. This would be if you substitute in 1 for all the values of n. So negative 1 to the first power times 1 plus 3. Negative 1 to the 1 is negative 1. And then 4. So it looks like the first term is negative 4. Second term. 
a sub 2 would be negative 1 squared times 2 plus 3. So negative 1 squared is positive 1, and then that's 5, so we'll get positive 5. Third term, a sub 3 would be negative 1 to the third, and then 3 plus 3. So negative 1 cubed is negative 1 again, and then 6, so negative 6. So what's the pattern that you're noticing with the sequence? It kind of looks like the values are growing, but they're alternating from negative to positive, negative. Let's see if the next will be positive. So the fourth term would be a sub 4, negative 1 to the fourth, and then 4 plus 3. So positive 1 times 7 is positive 7. So yeah, it alternate back to positive. And if the same pattern continues, the next term should be negative 8. Let's see, negative 1 to the fifth. 5 plus 3 is negative 1 times 8, and it is negative 8. So there's a couple features in this sequence that we need to point out. The values are increasing by 1 each time, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, but the signs are alternating, and what's alternating is negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and so on. The negative 1 to the n is what alternates the signs, and it's what makes the sequence called an alternating sequence. Right, one more. Number four, you can also have a sequence that represents fractions. So a sub n, 2 times n, divided by n plus 4. So this would be remind you of a rational function. So let's find the first five terms again. First term, substitute in 1 for the n. So 2 times 1, divided by 1 plus 4, you get 2 fifths. Second term, a sub 2 would be 2 times 2 divided by 2 plus 4, which is 4 sixths, and always reduce the fraction, so 2 thirds. Third term, a sub 3 is 2 times 3 divided by 3 plus 4, 6 sevenths. And then two more. Fourth term is a sub 4 which would be 2 times 4 divided by 4 plus 4. So you'll have 8 divided by 8, which is 1. And then let's try one more of the 5 terms. The fifth term would be a sub 5, which would be 2 times 5 divided by 4 plus 5, or 10 ninths. So this gives you an idea of how to find terms in a sequence if you know the nth term or the general term of the sequence. So we've already pointed out this, negative 1 to the n in our third problem was what made the sequence alternate signs. So now let's talk about the graph. What does a graph of a sequence look like? How does it differ from a graph of a function, like a linear function or an exponential function? Well, a sequence is a function, but the domain is not the set of all real numbers. The domain is only the positive integers. So that means the graph's going to look a little different. You can still graph in the Cartesian coordinate system or the xy plane, but the graph of a sequence is a set of discrete points. So in other words, the points are not connected with a graph. It's just a set of points. So let's look at the difference between the sequence where the general term is a sub n equals 1 divided by n and f of x equals 1 divided by x. Let's look at 1 over x first. So f of x equals 1 over x. This was called a rational function because you have a variable in the denominator and it's a polynomial divided by polynomial. We notice that x cannot be 0 and the domain, we wrote the domain for a rational function using interval notation. It was negative infinity to 0, 0 to infinity because we were representing all real numbers could be substituted in for the x. And this was interval notation. Okay, so now let's look at the sequence. a sub n equals 1 divided by n. It looks very similar, but what's different about this? It's a sequence of numbers. The domain is not the set of all real numbers. The domain was only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. 
That's a set of numbers. It was the counting numbers. Or positive integers. So you have to use set notation instead of using interval notation because it's only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Again, 1.5, 1.7, 1.899, even the number E is not in the, the counting numbers. So it's not in the set of a sequence for the domain. Okay, so what's the difference between the graphs? Well, the graph on the left, this is the rational function, f of x equals 1 divided by x. Notice that x cannot be equal to 0 because that gave us a vertical asymptote, which was um, x equals 0, and it's the y-axis. Or the y values grew without bound as x got closer and closer to 0 from the right side. And also, if x is getting very large, the y values approach the x-axis, but does not actually touch the x-axis. So this was a horizontal asymptote, y equals 0, which was the x-axis. Well, that does not happen with sequences of numbers. So the first term in the sequence of 1 divided by n is 1. The second number in the sequence is one half. The third term in the sequence is one third, and the fourth term would be one fourth. Notice that you cannot substitute in 1.2 or 1.4 or 1.56. Those are not values in the domain. So you only have this discrete set of points. Okay, so now the rest of the section is going to be about trying to find patterns. Finding patterns is very important in mathematics. So we're going to look at a sequence of numbers and see if we can find any patterns. So 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on, what's the pattern that you notice in this sequence? If we can generate the nth term or the general term, then we can find out any term in the sequence that we want, like the 15th term, without actually listing all the previous 14 terms. It looks like all these numbers are being squared. 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, and so on. So with this idea in mind, let's try example 2. We're going to find the nth term, or the general term, if we have the first several terms in a sequence given. So number one, negative one divided by one, one half, negative one fourth, one eighth, negative one sixteenth, and then the pattern continues forever. So what are some things that you notice in this sequence? Well, the numerator is either one or negative one. So in other words, the sequence is alternating signs from positive to negative, and the denominator are being multiplied by 2. From one term to the next. So in other words, you start with 1, you multiply by 2 to get 2, you multiply by 2 again, you get 4, multiply by 2, you get 8, and so on. So let's see if we can come up with a general term with just knowing this pattern in the numerator and denominator. So the general term, or as some people call it, the nth term, this would be a sub n. So keep in mind, the n is the variable, it's the input value for the nth term. So your formula will have n's. The numerator, we saw there was alternating signs, and we know that alternating signs will have a negative 1 to the n involved. But then, how about the denominator? Well, notice that these are all powers of 2. So it's base 2 to what power? Well, it turns out it needs to be n subtract 1. Well, the reason why it's not n and it's n minus 1 is we need the first term to be 2 to the 1 minus 1 power, which is 2 to the 0, which is 1. 
So you need to start at when the exponent is 0, which would give you 1. Then the next would be 2 to the first power, then 2 squared, then 2 cubed, then 2 to the fourth, and so on. So this is the correct nth term. Okay, let's try another problem, this time without fractions. Number 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, and then so on. So what are some things that you noticed about this sequence? Well, note that the next term in the sequence is found by adding 2. to the previous term. So if you take 3 and add 2, 5 you add 2, 7 you add 2, and so on. That's the only pattern that comes up in this sequence. So if that's the pattern, what's the general term? Or nth term? Keep in mind, again, the n is the variable. So we want n to be such that if we plug in 1 for n, we get 3. If we plug in 2 for n, we get 5. If we plug in 5 for n, we get 11 for the fifth term. Well, it's 2 times n because you want to increase the sequence by 2 by each time. But you want the first term to be 3. So if I substitute in 1 for n, that would be the first term. 2 times 1 is 2. So I have to add 1 to make sure the first term is 3. So now let's check. If I plug in, I don't know, 5 for the fifth term, 2 times 5 would be 10 plus 1. Yep, the fifth term is 11. So it looks like it's going to be good. Okay, so now let's look at what's called recursion formulas. The first example that we looked at, they gave us the nth term, or the general term, and they were asking us to find the first five terms based on a formula. Well, you can also have sequences defined in terms of recursive or recursion formulas. That means it's a formula that gives you the nth term as a function of some previous term or even multiple terms. So let's do a couple examples involving finding the first five terms using a recursion formula instead of having just the nth term. So number one, you have what's called an initial condition or initial term. This must be given for recursion formulas. So a sub 1 is going to be 7. And you also have a recursion formula. And this is given as a sub n equals a sub n minus 1 plus 5 for this first problem. Find the first five terms. So the first term. Well, this one's easy because this one's already given to us. It's 7. Second term. a sub 2. Well, how do you find the second term if there's not really a formula? Well, the recursion formula tells us how to obtain the second term if we have a previous term. So the nth term would be, well, 2 would be n. It's a sub 2 minus 1. So this n minus 1 is in a subscript. So it's a sub 1, 2 minus 1. And then you add 5. So the second term says you take the first term and you add 5. So 7 plus 5, 12. So now we have the second term. Third term a sub 3 would be a sub 3 is equal to a sub 3 minus 1. That's a sub 2. So you take the second term and you add 5. So 12 plus 5, 17. And this pattern continues for the next several terms. The fourth term would be the third term plus 5. So 17 plus 5 gives you 22. And the fifth term, a sub 5, would be the fourth term, plus 5, which is 27. So there's the first five terms of this sequence. 
using the recursion formula instead of having just a formula to plug in n. Okay, let's try one more. Number two, the initial condition this time will be a sub 1, which is 4, or the initial term is 4. And the recursion formula on how we're going to find out the next term will be a sub n equals negative 2 times a sub n minus 1, and then add 3. Okay, first term, a sub 1. Well, it's already given, 4. Second term, a sub 2 would be you take negative 2 times a sub 2 minus 1, well that's a sub 1, then you add 3. So take negative 2 times the previous term, which is 4, and then add 3. So you get negative 8 plus 3, or negative 5. So that's the second term. Third term would be a sub 3, negative 2 times a sub 2 plus 3. So you take the previous term, you multiply by negative 2, that gives you 10, and then you add 3, you get 13. Fourth term, a sub 4, is negative 2 times a sub 3 plus 3. So negative 2 times 13 plus 3, which gives you negative 26 plus 3, which is negative 23. And then the fifth term, a sub 5, negative 2 times a sub 4 plus 3 is negative 2 times the previous term is negative 23, and then add 3, and this will give you 46 plus 3, or 49. So there's the first five terms of this sequence. So why are recursion formulas so important? Well, you also have what's called the factorial notation that can come up with recursion formulas. So if you have products of consecutive positive integers, or counting numbers, they actually come up in sequences quite often. You can use factorial notation to abbreviate successive products. So this is factorial notation. So if you take statistics or any higher level math beyond college algebra, you'll see factorials. You may have already seen them in probability and statistics problems. So if n is a positive integer, the notation n and then an exclamation point so it's read as n factorial, is the product of all the previous positive integers starting with n and going down to 1. So in other words, n factorial would be n and then one integer less than n, n minus 1, then two integers less than n, n minus 2, and you stop when you get down to 1. So times dot dot dot, 3 times 2 times 1. By definition, 0 factorial is always equal to 1. And then these are the first 6 factorials. 0 factorial is 1 by definition. 1 factorial would just be the number 1, so the product would be 1. 2 factorial is 2 times 1, so you start with 2 and you multiply down to 1, so 2 times 1 is 2. 3 factorial, you start with 3 and you multiply down to 1, so 3 times 2 times 1, 6. 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 24. 5 factorial comes out to be 120. So example 4, let's calculate each of the following factorial expressions without using a calculator. So number 1, let's try 6 factorial. 6 factorial would be 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. You can put this in a calculator, but we're asked not to use 1. 5 factorial is 120. So this is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 two times 2 times 1. That's 5 factorial. So 6 times 5 factorial gives us 6 times 120, 720. So this is where it gets its idea behind recursive formula. You need the previous factorial to find out the next factorial. 
So number two, 17 factorial divided by 15 factorial. Now you might be wondering, how can we do this without a calculator? Well, let's just write out what this numerator and denominator actually would be. 17 factorial would be 17 times 16 times 15 times 14 times 13, dot, dot, dot. I'm not going to write them all. Times 3 times 2 times 1. The denominator would be 15, 14, 13, dot, 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 times 3 times 2 times 1, because it's 15 factorial. Well, notice that you're multiplying in the numerator and you're multiplying in the denominator, so you can cancel any common factors. 15s cancel out. 14s, 13s, 12s, 11s, 10s, all the way down to 1s. So it looks like the only factors that are remaining are 17 and 16, because the denominator is just 1. So 17 times 16 is 272. So that would be 17 factorial divided by 15 factorial. Number 3, 13 factorial divided by 5 factorial and also 8 factorial in the denominator. Let's try out the same idea as number 2. Let's write out what these factorials actually represent. So 13 factorial would be 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 all the way down to 1. And then that is divided by two different factorials are 5 factorial, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 8 factorial would be 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 5 factorial and 8 factorial is not 13 factorial. Notice that there's no 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 in the denominator. But what factors do cancel out? Well, 8, 7s, 6s, all the way down to 1s. So in the numerator, there's a 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9. The denominator has a 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And if you calculate this, it'll be 1,287. So number four. Let's try out one more of these factorial problems. 100 factorial divided by 98 factorial times 2 factorial. So the numerator would be 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Just like the last problem, 98 factorial would be 98 times 97 times 96 times 95, all the way down to 1. And then 2 factorial would be another 2 times 1. So this will factor 98s, 97s, 96s, 95s, 3s, 2, and 1. It looks like only 199 are remaining in the numerator. And the denominator is just the 2 times 1. And this turns out to be 4,950. So why are we talking about factorial problems? And why are we doing these without the calculator at first? Well, these are the kind of problems that can come up with sequences. So let's try the factorial out in the graphing calculator now. So grab your graphing calculator. And we're going to enter in factorials. So you type in the number first. So if you want to do 0 factorial, 0, and then factorial is underneath the math button on the left-hand side. And you have to scroll over to PRB or PROB, if you have a newer operating system, the probability menu, and it's number 4, the exclamation point, or factorial. 0 factorial is 1. 1 factorial would be 1. 2 factorial was 2. So with the factorials, let's try example 5 now. Find the first five terms for each of the following sequences where we have the nth term or the general term. So this is very similar to example 1, except it's going to involve factorials. So a sub n is n squared divided by n factorial. So find the first five terms. First term, a sub 1, 1 squared divided by 1 factorial. 1 divided by 1 is 1. Second term. So these should be very quick calculations now that we know how to calculate factorials. 2 squared divided by 2 factorial. 
2 squared is 4, 2 factorial is 2, so 2. Third term would be 3 squared divided by 3 factorial, so 9 divided by 6 is 3 halves. Fourth term, a sub 4, 4 squared divided by 4 factorial, 16 divided by 24, and this reduces to 2 thirds. And then fifth term, keep in mind we're just substituting in n for each value for the term. So 5 squared divided by 5 factorial would be 25 for 5 squared, 5 factorial is 120, and this will also reduce to 5 24ths. Okay, so number two, let's try out another factorial problem. This time a sub n is n factorial divided by 2 raised to the n power. So a combination of factorials and also combination of exponential functions. So a sub 1 would be 1 factorial divided by 2 to the first power, 1 half. Second term, a sub 2 would be 2 factorial divided by 2 squared, so 2 fourths, which is also 1 half. So the sequence starts 1 half, 1 half. Third term would be a sub 3, 3 factorial divided by 2 to the third power, 6 divided by 8, 3 fourths. Fourth term is 4 factorial divided by 2 to the 4th power. So 4 factorial is 24, and 2 to the 4th is 16, so this reduces to 3 halves. And then 5th term, 5 factorial divided by 2 to the 5th, 120 divided by 32 would reduce to 15 fourths. So there's the first five terms in that sequence. So notice that these two sequences are doing entirely different things. The first sequence that we looked at, the numerator is being squared. So those numbers would 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, the next would be 36. The factorials though are 1, 2, 6, 24, 120. So the factorial is growing faster than a quadratic like x squared or n squared would. So this sequence is getting very small because the denominator is getting very large. However, on number two, notice that the factorial is in the numerator this time and the denominator is an exponential function like 2 to the x or 2 to the n. The factorials were 1, 2, 6, 24, 120. The denominator are 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and the next will be 64. Well, the factorial is growing much faster than even 2 to the n power is. So this sequence, even though these are very small right now, these are increasing in value. So this function, this sequence, will grow indefinitely. So that finishes up our discussion on sequences. If you have any questions about any of the examples that we talked about in this section involving the general term or the nth term or factorials, please let me know. And if you have any questions over the homework, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about arithmetic sequences.